Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome, my name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about the experience of pain after you have completed your cancer treatment. This is such a big topic and obviously it's impossible to cover all the different scenarios in one hour. So tonight we're going to be focus on, focusing on some general recommendations along with specific advice regarding neuropathic pain. However, we do hope in the future to conduct some more webinars on the subject of pain and addressing other issues. We had a lot of questions, around about 90 or so questions, um, and a lot about specific issues that we may not be discussing tonight, but as I said, we would like to be doing in the future. So first, some housekeeping. Uh, if you experience any technical problems, you can either mention them in the chat box, which you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen, and there's a 1800 number there, you can dial that number and um, speak to somebody and they will help you and give you passcode and you can dial in on your phone. But we want to hear from you in the chat box tonight. Let us know what you think about what we're presenting, chat to each other. Don't worry too much if you get distracted because we do record the webinars and you can watch them later. So if you need to speak to anyone at all, if anything's come up for you during the webinar, you can contact a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14, which is available 24 hours a day. So let's get started. Firstly, I'd like to introduce our panel. So sitting next to me is Phil, who's going to talk about his story, and me, and David. So welcome. We have Lauren sitting in the chat box tonight, so please say hello to her as well. So I'm going to hand over to Phil now, hand the mouse over, and... Um, here we go. Here's Phil's story. And here's the mouse. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that would all work. Well, my story really started right back in the beginning from the, um, from the surgery and then all the way through chemotherapy. The, the constant thing that I kept on thinking about is I just want to be normal again. And how long is it going to take to be normal again? You just click on the slide. No, you got it there? Yeah. Sorry. We will get there. Very touchy now. Oh, okay. There you go. Right. So we get to the end of chemotherapy, and uh, when it's a case of where do I go from here, I'm mean, just, just like I'm a miserable ball of pain. I have no idea what's going to happen, and I have no idea what the future is going to bring. Um, but when I spoke to my oncologist, and I said, what can I do? How can I get, get past all of this? He just gave me two very, very simple suggestions, exercise and attitude. Now he said we know that exercise works for peripheral neuropathy uh, and he said we know that attitude works but we have no idea why. So he said all I can do is suggest to you that you just maintain, he said you've been fit when you came in, try and get fit all over again. So because in my, <clears throat> my process was I had a new uh, uh, chemotherapy drug and I went through a series of research uh, uh, episodes with different people, different at the university and so on. And uh, I was prodded and poked and electri uh, electrocuted so many times, but and they, they couldn't tell me anything, but they said it will be passed in five years. So then I had a date to work for. So from that point on, uh, I have to say that the areas of pain that I am uh, well went through, and the focus on the head, hands and feet, I was fortunate because internally everything went back to normal fairly quickly. I didn't have headaches. So it was really just what I was experiencing in my head, hands and feet. So if we deal with feet first. Pins and needles, sharp spasms, numbness, buzzing. I can give you a list even longer than that. But what it all meant was that I had to get out and walk and walk again as long as I possibly could, which is pretty much impossible because as I was walking, it's like walking on uh, cotton wool. You've got no contact with the ground at all. The sharp pains, like having rocks in your, in your shoes and so on. But by doing a little bit at a time, to the front gate, to the end of the street, down the road, and eventually, after a few years, I got up to about 10 k's uh, a time. So it, it became a, uh, a hard thing to do, but what it meant was that I was achieving a bit more each time that I did it. Um, the other thing about um, <clears throat> uh, being up the distance, that's right. The, the other problem is, is standing. Um, 
if I'm walking, it's 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 not too bad. When I'm standing, the pressure's on both feet, and it becomes a real issue. So or, the whole thing is sitting down, putting your feet up. <clears throat> um, the next challenge I had to face was tennis, trying to play tennis again. Now I went back onto the court a few months after I finished chemo, and I just couldn't. The ducking, the diving, nothing would work. So I had to stop that. But then my group of friends said, why don't you come down every week and we'll give you five minutes, then seven minutes, then 10 minutes. Eventually, after a long period of time, I got up to a full hour, full hour, two hours eventually. So it was just that incremental uh, perseverance that allowed me to get back into tennis again. Walking upstairs was always a problem. So I always had to grab the handrail. And of course, we have a lot of stairs at home. So getting down the stairs and up was just a nightmare. But once again, slowly, 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 you eventually get through it all. I also went to a physiotherapist who um, did foot massages, which was great for a while. And then she uh, recommended hot baths of, foot baths of um, uh, cinnamon and fresh ginger and so on. I thought it just didn't work anyway. <laughs> so I let that one go by. <clears throat> the next, looking at my hands, uh, this was, I became a real uh, a disaster in dexterity. It was a real, real issue. I, um, I became very clumsy. I couldn't pick up anything without dropping it, which meant that as soon as I broke a few cups and plates and stuff, I couldn't load or unload the dishwasher, which is, that was a plus. <laughs> but I mean, I couldn't button my shirt. I couldn't literally button the shirt. I couldn't, which, thank God for zippers and trousers, but I couldn't, I couldn't even tie my shoes. So, slip-ons. So you, you adjust all the way through. Mm. Um, chopsticks, don't even think about chopsticks. <clears throat> no Chinese. No, no, no Chinese at all. <laughs> uh, you're with a spoon. Um, before, before I started chemo, I had a very elegant uh, a calligraphic style of, of handwriting. And when I was mostly all the way through chemo, I could not recognise my own signature. Mm. That's how bad it became. I couldn't, I couldn't touch uh, a keyboard because it was too painful. I couldn't draw. I couldn't couldn't do anything at all. So all that meant was that I had to practice. It was back to exercise again. So every day without fail, I type a bit, I draw a bit, I I write a bit, till eventually it all started to come back. But it was only through that that perseverance of doing that. Um, the other thing, of course, was tennis. Holding a tennis racket that was like holding a a sharp knife, but. A little bit at a time, that's that five minutes, seven minutes, ten minutes with the boys. That eventually went away after a few years. It comes back, but it's still, I can still play tennis, which is the most important thing. Um, but the tennis thing is really interesting because I've said this to people so many times. When you play tennis for an hour or two hours, all you can do is look at this yellow ball. So you, and I call it mobile meditation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of that period of time, you're totally clean and it's, it's such a good thing, it clears your head out. But the whole thing with all of this is the fact that you don't have an option. You've just got to keep on doing, keep on pushing at it. Then you get down to my <coughs> my head. After uh, what seven seven months of chemo, you you don't sleep well. You start taking sleeping tablets. You've got fatigue. You've got um, I don't know what about. Uh, you're dizzy. Tinnitus just drives you crazy. But and what that does is you can't concentrate. You can't you can't think about it. you really are a bit of a bit of a mess. So what that meant was that I had to um, I had to I did, had got a few projects from clients who understood where I was and just do that bit. But the more I worked, the more I found that I could do a bit more. So it was a bit more work and a bit more work and a bit more work. And then of course uh, reading. I've, I've always been a prolific reader for you know, novels, books, you know, newspapers, uh, everything. And the more I did that, the sharper my, my focus became. So that, that really helped a hell of a lot. Um, and of course, the daily crossword, all like pushing your brain in all different directions makes it a big, big difference. So really, out of those three areas, that's how it all came together for me, just little bit by little bit by little bit. So where am I today after uh, progress? Um, I still can't walk properly in bare, with bare feet. The shoes still give me a bit of a buffer. Um, most of my feet are okay, but occasionally I get a bad, bad, uh, bad feet day. Um, 
However, I can, um, <coughs> pardon me, I can still walk for 12 to 15 k's three to four times a week. I play singles tennis twice a week with guys sometimes at 10 years younger than I am. Um, it, it becomes a whole achievement thing that you actually get there after all of this time. And the, the normal, I might not be perfectly normal, but the thing is that it's really close normal. So it, it's it's like I think I've come an enormous amount after uh, nearly eight eight years. Sorry, eleven years. Eleven years it is. It was a long road, but the only way that I actually got there is just by incremental steps in the head, feet, and and, and hands. And um, uh, so normal, I'm nearly there. But the only problem with this now is, of course, that. Um, I have to load and unload the dishwasher <laughs> <laughs> because it's that good. And I think that's me. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. It's a great story. And you gave up your game of tennis tonight. And I did. To be I here did. with thank us. You. So thank you. So we're going to hand over to uh, Neve now. So we'll hand the mouse over. Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Um, Very touchy. Thanks, Phil, for your introduction. And I hope that my talk will. Um, build on that quite a bit because I think a lot of the themes that you've brought up are things that we use a lot when we um, talk about pain management. Um, and my background is that I'm a musculoskeletal physiotherapist, but I do a lot of pain research and um, and, and pain management. Um, and so I'll be taking a bit of a broader approach um, to this topic. Let's see. So I'll tell you what I'll be talking about. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about a contemporary perspective on pain and just its multidimensional nature, and I think that's what Phil was talking about quite a bit, about how it's really important to look at different aspects of pain um, and use that to, as part of your therapy. Um, and I'm going to use that then to talk about six options for pain management. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about pain med medication or interventional medicine, as we talked about, um, but I'll mention a couple of things along the way. Okay, so let's start. A contemporary view of pain. Most of us grow up with this model of pain here where we injure our ankle and, and we consider that we and a nerve signal is sent from our ankle up through the spinal cord, up through the nervous system and into the brain. And this is actually a very traditional um, perception of pain and how it works. Um, and it was fine back in the 16th century, but we know an awful lot more about how pain works these days and a key focus for us is, is understanding the changes that occur in the nervous system and why they occur. And so in many cases, there may be this source of what we call nociception or danger signaling um, that can send um, a message through the nervous system and, and, and up through the spinal cord and into the brain. But there's a lot of processing that happens along the way. And there's a lot of things that, that can influence that. And so, for instance, when we talk about neuropathic pain, and I know that David will talk about this to, um, to a greater degree in a moment, um, often there is some damage to the nervous system, and that increases the excitability of the nervous system. And so you've got nerves that are firing um, um, in, an, in an abnormal way. When these signals kind of reach the brain, at this point, there's another layer of processing that goes on. And instead of there being a pain center in the brain, we know that different areas in your brain um, become active. And there are areas related to sensation or movement, um, uh, but there are also areas related to decision making and emotion, etc. And and so it's this um, the brain's processing of how important is this really, how threatening is this, that gives us this experience of pain, and we can modulate that. So we have a natural kind of pharmacy in our brains that can help to modulate um, signals in our nervous system. We release endorphins and serotonin and GABA and chemicals that can actually calm the nervous system down. Sorry, can I go back? Is that possible? Yeah, you have to just click the little arrows, oh, I think, sorry. to go backwards. Yeah, sorry, I must have picked that by yeah. mistake. Um, and so with these different areas in our brain that can, can activate and calm the nervous system down, um, but they can also stop working as well as they should, and so they're not modulating pain or controlling pain as well as we would like. Um, and so we start to talk about things like peripheral and central sensitization. 
What we've tapped into over the last couple of decades are the many things that influence this processing. And so this source of nociception is part of the, the, the things like the neuropathic pain and disruption to the, the way the nervous system is processing is certainly part of that system. But it's also influenced by how much focus and attention we place on an area. And so Phil talked nicely about how distraction of that yellow ball can be really effective. Um, our mood, whether we're anxious and stressed or depressed, that can really influence how sensitive our nervous system is. Um, and of course, our pre previous experiences, our expectations, etc., can really influence just how, how sensitive this nervous system is. So the good thing about that is that it gives us opportunities for, for managing pain. Um, and I think that's a really key message with this. So we talk a lot about a biopsychosocial model of health. We talk about it a lot in how we teach about pain, and we, we try to embrace that in, in our clinical treatment. And what that means is that we um, focus on you, the person, in terms of your biological factors that are really important, but also the psychological and social factors, and trying to understand those. So in terms of biological factors that relate to cancer treatment, of course, things like um, whether there's nerve damage and, and neuropathy, secondary to chemotherapy, etc., are really important. Whether there is some tissue damage associated with surgery is, uh, is important. But so too are many other factors. And when we look at risk factors for persistent pain, it isn't just these biological factors that are at play. We actually know that mood and stress and depression, your emotional well-being, and how you cope um, is is are independent predictors of whether you have persistent pain or not. Um, and again, those are things that we have, we have good control over. We can actually try and, and manage those quite effectively. Um, other things that influence and in terms of biological factors will be things like our physical activity, and I'll talk about that a bit. Sleep pattern, which is obviously really important around cancer treatment, will be very important. And social engagement and meaningful social engagement, doing the things you enjoy, doing the things that are meaningful for you, is part of, um, of that processing pattern. And, and again, we know, we know that that can influence your risk of having persistent pain. So what I'm going to do now is talk about some options for pain relief. Um, and the first I'm going to talk about is understanding pain. And we've done a lot of research on this in um, areas like chronic low back pain, where, um, and we've demonstrated pretty good evidence at this point that if you understand how pain works in terms of that biopsychosocial model um, and the, the multidimensional nature of pain, that actually helps to reduce your pain. We think it's because it helps to reduce fear and anxiety, um, and that it gives you a better awareness of, of your relevant contributing factors. Um, so that you can actually start to manage those in a more effective way. And that we get away from just the find it and fix it approach of, I need to find the source of this um, and fix that, and rather take a much more holistic approach to pain management. How do you go about doing that? Well, I think talks like this are wonderful. Um, I, there's lots of great resources like Explain Pain Book, and I've got some resources listed at the end of the talk, which would be really helpful for you. And I think you need to probably um, talk to a healthcare practi practitioner that, that has a good understanding of pain that can help you with this if those resources aren't um, uh, you know, doing the trick. I think being you know, your own experiment and understanding what your pain triggers are and how you, and your pain responses to different things are is really critical as well. The next option is um, looking at sources of psych psychological distress that might be relevant for you. Um, and so this is a particularly stressful time for people, of course, um, and, um, and managing that and understanding that I think is really, is really critical. Depending on how, um, how deeply affected you are with this, again, it may be the best thing to, to speak to an appropriate healthcare practitioner because you may need additional counselling or um, psychological care. And I think that's really important to seek that out if that's really relevant for you. But again, become your own experiment. See what triggers your pain and if mood and stress and things like feeling low are part of that. And, and they're certainly likely to be part of that across the course of your, your cancer treatment. And, but, 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 but monitoring that, I think, is quite important. And often we can't remove the stress or the stressor, but our response to that stressor can be controlled. 
So that's the mindfulness and your mindful movement, I think, is, is a wonderful example mm. of that. Um, and again, there's more data coming out demonstrating that mindfulness-based stress reductions are really effective, at least as effective as other interventions for pain management. So I think that's quite, quite a critical um, and useful thing that you might explore. Mm. Um, I've put in just a note about medication. I, didn't, I said I wasn't going to talk about this in great detail, but um, timely and appropriate analgesia is, is quite effective or, or is, is, um, is important. And I say that because there's so much information coming out now suggesting that um, early analgesia after in that early post-op phase um, isn't getting enough attention. And, and I think it's an area where we could probably Im improve on that. Um, and I think you've got, you may need to be quite vocal about the pain that you're experiencing um, and, 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 and talk to your, your doctor, talk to your oncology team about that. Um, so getting appropriate pain relief is, is important and can be really good for other aspects of your rehab. So sometimes um, as a physio, we're often advocating physical activity and sometimes we need there, there to be better pain control before we can engage in some of those processes. So they, they can work hand in hand. It's important to remember though that um, some pain medication can cause side effects and if you're on them for too long they can actually cause your nervous system to become sensitive um, and so there may need to be a weaning process. So um, I would suggest that you adhere to prescription dose. I think if you're on pain medication for a while you need to have that reviewed and you may need to consider weaning off some medications as well. Number four is move more. Um, and of course, I'm a physiotherapist, so I'm always going to be advocating physical activity. Um, it's uh, one of the most effective conservative treatments for pain. Um, and it addresses lots of issues and impairments that we see associated with cancer treatment, such as um, weakness, loss of flexibility, fatigue, sleep disturbance. Um, and what's really interesting that e is that the, there is data that sh shows that even small amounts of low to moderate intensity exercise during a cancer treatment can be helpful for fatigue. So it seems really paradoxical that when you're at your tiredest, most fatigued, that we send you out for exercise <laughs> um, <laughs> but, <laughs> and nobody wants to do it, but it's actually the most effective thing. Um, and, um, when, and, and so it's really important to help them. I'll talk about this a little bit more with sleep and just getting sleep-wake cycles under control and how physical activity is actually important for that. It's really good for your mood. Um, and it helps recovery of muscles and bone density following treatment. So we know many treatments, um, and particularly if you're on corticosteroids, can have a, a negative impact. Um, on, on your muscle and bone density. And so um, aerobic and strengthening exercise, so resistance exercise is quite important here and um, can be quite effective for that. And of course, exercise is really helpful for preventing other health issues. So we really need to be thinking about it for our heart and lung problems, for diabetes and cancer, other cancer as well, and preventing and prevention. So that's the why of this. How do you go about doing this? Well. Um, Phil, again, I'm just saying you really set my talk up so nicely because it's, it's the same thing again. It's, it's um, start small, build slowly. Um, if you're not sure, if you're not used to exercising, if you don't have a background in exercise, I think you should go and see a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist that's um, skilled in exercise prescription um, uh, to, to assess a safe and appropriate starting dose for you and to kind of monitor you in that early stage. Um, but low intensity exercise, so we're talking easy exercise, going for a walk every other day is not a bad place to start. How much do we need to do? Um, so international guidelines on physical activity recommendations say that we all need to be doing about two and a half hours of moderate exercise a week and that should include some vigorous exercise for those who are fit enough to do it. So we don't go out and start running marathons straight off the bat, or you don't start doing 10 minutes of sprints. I'm not suggesting that for an instance. But that's a, it, it's good to have that in the back of your mind that ultimately that's where we all need to be getting to. And I know how much of a struggle that is in a busy world. Um, and it, it, you know, it's, a, it's always devastating to me as a physio when I'm not getting my two and a half hours of, of, of exercise a week. 
Um, in terms of the type of exercise, you do need some aerobic exercise, um, so walking, running, swimming, etc. Um, and some resistance exercise is very important for, for muscle um, um, preservation and the prevention of muscle deterioration. So um, we do need to do a bit of resistance exercise in there as well. And that's probably where a lot of people may need a little bit of guidance to get started. Can you explain what resistance exercises is sure. in case someone doesn't understand yeah, what I mean? Yeah, so it's really um, doing things like using for up your upper body using weights. Um, where you're using a resistance uh, to um, generate a force, so you would tend to do sets of like 8 to 12 repetitions. Um, for the lower limb, we can do weights on you know, leg machines and so on, but even things like squats and stairs will be providing a, a fair bit of resistance, and using that at body weight can be quite effective. Um, is that, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then some flexibility exercise and some balance training will be will quite important. So that's really what we all should be kind of aiming for. Yes. Well, I'm after doing it again. Yes. Sorry. I will go back. Improve your sleep. Um, I think it's fascinating that since the turn of the century, we're all getting about two hours less sleep than we used to be, than our predecessors were a night. Um, so we consider poor sleep to be less than seven hours of sleep per night. Um, and, and certainly if you're having trouble getting to sleep um, or waking during the night and it's disturbed, um, your sleep quality starts to, to go down. Um, and poor sleep and illness and injury are really commonly associated. So we see um, lots of research around associations between poor sleep and things like heart disease, musculoskeletal injury, obviously fatigue and mood disturbance. I know how grumpy I am after a poor night's sleep. Um, and again, we've got great data that when your sleep improves, your pain improves. So we've got data from um, populations who have pain, chronic pain, and also in experimental pain models. So if I sleep deprived Jill and, um, and then prod her with a, a pressure algometer and see how much it hurts, it will hurt more when I'm sleep deprived, mm -hmm. when you're sleep deprived. And again, we all sort of know that, don't we? It's kind of common sense as well. So when we talk about managing it, um, sometimes if it's a significant problem, um, you may need to have this assessed in more detail and there are sleep clinics where they'll assess your sleep overnight and if you've got things like sleep apnea, you may need to have some interventions like a CPAP, etc. Um, but for many of us, it's about adopting good sleep hygiene. Um, and we sort of, again, all know how to do this um, because this is what we do with, with little kids when we're trying to get them to sleep. We create good sleep environments. We make sure that the room is very conducive to sleep. We look at um, trying to improve sleep wake patterns, physical activity and regularity during the day, going to bed at a regular time, not eating and um, drinking caffeine and alcohol late at night, um, and things like changing the timing of fluids to reduce your need to, to get up to the, during the night to go to the bathroom. So just Adopting some of those sleep hygiene um, um, strategies can be really effective. So my last thing is, is about improving your social support. Um, and, and it's just a you know, big broad brush stroke here about people with better social support have better health outcomes um, for, for most things, and, and pain is no exception. So that thing about doing all the meaningful yeah. things is just really critical um, in terms of pain management. Um, you know, doing some, something that's enjoyable and, um, and you're out and about with your friends, you're going to be releasing some of those endorphins and getting some pain anal analgesia mm -hmm. from your natural um, pharmacy that's in your brain and your, in your nervous system. So your tennis buddies helped you. Thanks, they sure did. <laughs> so do you need to see a healthcare professional um, for some of the, these things? You may do. And I think if any of these things are, are particularly problematic for you, I think you should think about um, seeking some support, and I've given uh, some outlines here about how um, an appropriate healthcare professional can help for some of these things. Um, one step at a time, I would agree. Again, you know, baby steps and keep going with it over a prolonged period. But I think if you're looking at these six options and you're wondering where to start because all of them are relevant for you, pick one and set yourself up for success with one of them, and then you'll usually get carry over into the others. Um, I've provided some resources which I think um, are, will be very good for um, some of these issues that I've talked about. And there's some that offer online treatments like the Macquarie University Research Online Treatment Program. 
So we'll provide all those resources in another document too, so people okay. can click through and Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Jill. Thank um, and just to let you know that we are recruiting for a focus group. So if you'd like to come and talk to us about your pain experience, if you've had breast cancer treatment in the last few years, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Thank very you, Neve. Nice. And hand over to David now. So if you just yeah, just click on the big slide and yeah. we'll go through. Okay. Right. So um, look, two two very eloquent and and clear talks. So um. I guess I'm going to focus very much on an area we've been researching for some time. So I, it's fair to say that uh, neuropathic pain after cancer treatment as opposed to during or because of cancer has been a bit of a Cinderella area. And But you've heard very eloquently from Phil about the impact it can have on life afterwards. So that's really why we and I mean a, a group of people, I certainly don't just mean myself, but a group of neurologists, neurophysiologists, some other basic animal scientists have all gotten together to set up a centre to try and increase the study of this area. Um, so I just want to talk about the area that we particularly uh, are funded to research now, which is chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. And Hence my request to Phil, which he was kind enough to do, to give you a flavour of what that can mean. Um, the peripheral nervous system, you've already seen the diagram is involved in a variety of areas. So the spinal cord has these nerves that come out and either supply sensation, provide the stimulus for movement, or can be involved in the autonomic system, which is involved with sweating and bowel function. And, and other aspects of the body. Um, so I'll just, I might have to skip a few slides, but partly because you've heard them and partly because there's probably too many and we want to give you plenty of time to ask us. But it's characterised by all of the things that Phil talked about, that feeling of pins and needles, that numbness, the impact subsequently of loss of balance, <laughs> burning sensation, you've really heard all of them. And they're very classically described by almost everybody. So why is this a problem and why do we want to focus on it? I think it's a, a dividend of the fact that cancer treatment is actually achieving results. And there are more and more people who've gone through treatment successfully and come out the other side with some of the consequences of having to have had very intensive treatment. And this is just a trajectory showing the number of people worldwide who are going to have experienced cancer treatment or actually maybe going through early diagnosis and pretty simple treatment. So I don't want to mean that everybody on that trajectory is going to have had very heavy treatment. It might have been removal of skin cancer, but globally it's a pretty significant number of people. Um, and so the characters that we talked about of what we're focused on, chemotherapy-induced neuropathy, um, have the sort of symptoms that we started to talk about, the pain and the burning, the tingling, that electric shock feeling, and the temperature sensitivity. So if we look at, well, how common is this? So this was a very large effort where a group of researchers read every single article that anybody had written saying, I studied a group of people with chemotherapy-induced neuropathy. And by adding all of the individual studies together, you start to get a flavour of, well, what's the average when you look at it? And so the prevalence, that is, how often will it be reported by a person who's had chemotherapy? Well, north of 50% of patients were reported. But it's very clear that only certain types of chemotherapy will account for most of the impact. And the vast majority of chemotherapies are not associated with nerve damage and nerve side effects. Um, but what influences whether exposure to this noxious stimulus will result in a long-term problem? There aren't that many associations we understand. That's why we're pretty excited to be working in the area. But Baseline, having already had nerve damage from diabetes, say, is really going to put you at high risk. Mm -hmm. A history of smoking is associated. We definitely know that kidney function is important because we know that with reduced kidney function, there's already an incidence of nerve damage. And then 
when people during treatment start to talk about getting cold sensation and that causing a pain-like effect when they dip their hands in cold water or when they get into the ocean or where they might be washing up or they're going outside and it's suddenly a really cold morning and they've gotten up early and they feel pain, that's kind of telling you something about what nerve damage might be happening. And then there are genetic associations, these things called polymorphisms. So we all have, so there's a set of genes. So gene A is involved in controlling movement. Well, it, we don't all have the same amount of gene A. We actually have slightly different amounts of gene A and it doesn't really manifest every day in our ability to grip something. But under stress or pressure, our ability to have that nerve do its function can be slightly differently affected and we can be more prone to damage and therefore at higher risk with certain type of subtle genetic changes which are not abnormalities they're just a variant of normal and one of the things we're very interested in is trying to understand maybe you could predict that a particular person would suffer very badly with a particular drug maybe you could substitute a different one and still get the same result without mm. the consequent nerve damage. So that's a very exciting area, very complicated, lots of genetic work to be done, but it, it certainly looks promising. The biggest problem is there are thousands of polymorphisms and trying to work out one that really matters from all the noise of the other 999 is, is a big challenge. But big computers and big data are working towards solving that problem. Okay, so there's a variety of chemotherapies associated with peripheral neuropathy, and, and principal ones are the platinum-like drugs and the taxane drugs and vincristine and certain drugs used in hematological malignancies like bortezomib. And the, the important point to make is they don't all damage in the same place. So if you look here at to make is they don't all damage in the same place. So if you look here at the back of the, of the spinal column and then the nerve as it comes out till it ends up in the fingers and toes, there are really different parts of that nerve and different functions of the nerve that are very specifically affected by different drugs. So you can see that it, that makes it very complicated to talk about prevention because you want to prevent in a very specific way what you know the damage may be. So understanding the mechanism of the damage is, a, is where you've got to start. So how do you measure nerve damage anyway? Um, there are really many different ways and I'm not going to go into it in detail because I'm not a neurophysiologist or a neurologist. I'm just the guy who administers the drugs that causes the problem. But, but um, how do we measure nerve damage? So first of all, from thousands of patients, there are what we call these scales that clinicians, doctors and nurses, when interviewing patients, will use to say nerve damage developing and here's the severity of the nerve damage. Then my neurophysiology colleagues have electrical stimulation ability to measure nerve function. I'll talk about, a bit more about that in a minute. And then neurologists use different techniques, including using pins and functional tests to work out what's missing and, and what's still there. And finally, and I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about it, we finally realised that asking the patient actually can tell you something quite valuable, <laughs> as you heard only uh, 20 minutes ago. And we doctors love to do this, and scientists. So we now have a, an acronym, it's called PROs, Patient Reported Outcomes. But what it really means is listening to the patient. Um, so there are a lot of very refined tools and ones that we've been interested in here, as you can see, big setup, the computer, lots of different electrical stimuli. And that's because um, measuring sensation adds to the, the more traditional motor function and large sensory fibre nerve function, which is, happens in every neurological department of every hospital in the world. Um, and so the grading scales, I don't want you to focus on this, but I, I just wanted to point out to you that the top one, the commonly used one, is a very simple one where the clinician will ask the patient about their function 
and will grade it according to how much loss of function they have from grade one, minimal loss of function to grade four, very severe loss of uh, mobility. A much more complicated approach is to include the nerve testing that can be done with simple tests at the bedside and therefore getting a composite view both from testing as well as from asking a question and getting an answer. And we found that when you add the testing to asking the question, you get a, a more refined understanding of what's going on. And so it allows you to get a better grading system. It's not just one, two, three, and four, but the more subtle things that Phil talked about. So, you know, when you first ask him a question, he'd tell you, yes, I'm doing everything I have to do. But then he starts to tell you how difficult it is to walk up and down the stairs mm -hmm. and how the old grading systems wouldn't differentiate between this mild to mild to moderate versus severe. But the patient reported outcomes has been really the big step forward. So you can see that in this particular study of 85 patients, so 19% reported neuropathic symptoms and 56% had really quite significant systems, but the clinician said, you know, almost no one's got a problem. That was their interpretation. And as we've done repeated examples of that, we've really started to understand that there's quite a gulf between what patients report when they're given an independent questionnaire and what clinicians rate as a problem that the patients have. And that's true in many other issues like fatigue, uh, for instance, after treatment, as well as neuropathic problems. So I, I came across this yesterday <laughs> and I thought it really eloquently tells a story that, that it's only when we started to understand that we needed to combine. There's no one answer combining these answers. So the next thing is to make it more systematic because, you know, everybody will have a different story to tell. If you want to study a thousand people, you can't go through their qualitative reports. You need to have some scales, but scales that are validated that tell the story that the patient is trying to get across to you. And so there's actually a number of scales now that we use that we give patients to fill out that we can then get a score from, add that to then the tests we do and start to say, where do they fit on the scale of severe damage to minor damage? Um, so we add objective assessments to that um, and how do we do it? We do actual formal nerve testing. So I'm going to quickly go through this. We've done some work um, with our form of specialised sensory testing where we showed with people who've been exposed to oxaliplatin that up to 75% had some persisting symptoms and uh, you're not going to really be able to see that but there's a relationship between dose received um, I think I'll skip that. It's probably a bit technical. So the next thing is, well, what can we do about it? Well, there's a whole bunch of trials using neuroprotective agents. None of them have been really successful yet. So we haven't identified a good neuroprotective agent yet. In terms of treatment, we're a bit short of ideas as well, but there's at least one drug, initially an antidepressant, but not for its antidepressant properties, that can help with really painful neuropathy called duloxetine. But our real strategies at the moment are what you heard about, the holistic non-pharmacological treatments and remembering them. But most importantly, we're at least getting to the point of categorising and understanding uh, just what the degree of disability is. And a very important other thing that uh, I wanted to stress is kind of um, remembering to introduce early measures and patient reported outcomes and identify early so that whatever interventions we do have, we can use early. Because the earlier you introduce an intervention, the more likely it is that it'll be effective and short circuit the problem early. And, and that's really led to our new program funded by Cancer Institute New South Wales. And it involves a large group of centres, both um, within Sydney and actually some partners in South Australia and, and in Queensland, as well as many hospitals across the city. And our goal is to both um, develop better tests, to identify the problem, understand the problem better, 
animal models to work out better candidates for neuroprotection and other interventions such as exercise. And that's really the, the themes of our program over the next five years. And the first thing that we've kicked off just recently, and we have a website, is that we're going to be doing a mail out and a large survey to kind of get a really good idea in the Australian setting of just how pervasive or not neuropathic pain is as a problem in those who've gone through chemotherapy. We're going to be both doing cross-sectional, that is anybody at any time in their journey either just finished or finished five years ago and get an, a snapshot of where they're at and what they report, as well as picking up patients before they start, because that's the gold standard, and following them carefully with some objective measures as well as subjective measures. And we're going to be doing some intervention studies. We're going to try and look at the duloxetine a bit more carefully. We have some ideas about exercise and dose that we think need to be understood. The dose of exercise required is really not understood at all yet. And, and it's really a fertile area to explore. So the next five years promises to at least try and deliver some outcomes for patients in New South Wales, in Sydney in particular, and nationally. And I'd say that really there are only a relatively limited number of places around the world that are addressing this as an issue, um, but a lot more than as recently as even five years ago, and certainly not at all when Phil started and joined us mm. by contributing his information to the start of our research in this area. So I've probably gone a bit over time and I apologise for that, no, but it's okay. a great topic. And um, we certainly welcome people going to our <laughs> website and contributing to the work that we're going to do. So there was a question posed by Nell, um, just saying that she'd heard that nerves regrow, if that's true, and how long does it take? Well, they, they can regrow, but not inevitably, and it's not 100%. Mm. And we're talking growth measured in years, not weeks. Yeah. So it's a very yeah. slow process, hence the need for interventions along the way, and not just waiting for it all to resolve. And they don't necessarily grow back functionally in the same way that they started. You're probably never going to be able to recapitulate what you mm. were born with when you've had damage, even when it re recovers anatomically. Mm. Yeah, good question. So I might be able to just give them out. I can't quite read the questions if you make them bigger. Um, and so there was, I think we were addressing, there's a question sitting up there from Karen, but I think that's actually, if you have a look at the questions here. So we did, as I said earlier, we did get a lot of questions um, with specific medical questions. It's really not the forum here for, for us to be, you know, answering your questions that are specific to your particular situation. And the thing we suggest that you do is you talk to your medical specialist or your GP and, you know, go and seek that advice from them. So but what we will talk about, we start with the first question, um, how does radiation therapy and chemotherapy affect pain as a survivor? So we've kind of been talking about the chemotherapy aspect, not so much about the radiation therapy. So with so, neuropathy, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about the radiation side of it. Much less common than chemotherapy induced. It's, it's yeah. not very common, but you can get nerve damage. You're shining this ray every day up to five weeks to a particular area, and there are going to be nerves within that area. What's really complex is that many people have had cancer surgery. That's also going to cause nerve damage. That nerve damage is not going to get better or worse just because you have the extra treatments afterwards. So it's unfold, unpicking what's the cause can often be quite difficult. Mm. In our areas, um, it, it's often that the surgery isn't going to contribute to nerve damage, and then you can really say it's chemotherapy related. I think it's more complicated than than just one modality. Mm. Um, how does it do it? Well, radiation is going to actual nerve damage. The chemotherapy, as I showed you, a variety of different ways that it can interfere with the function of a nerve. Um, I really want to emphasize that the majority of people don't get it. It's not a 100% guaranteed outcome that you're going to get pain just because you have treatment. And there are many chemotherapies that are not associated with nerve damage or nerve pain at all. 
Mm. And that was one of the questions um, Kamal asked earlier about the different kinds of chemo treatment and the symptoms. I, think, I guess he was referring to the neuropathic symptoms, um, which really you've covered. Yeah. You know, and it is identified in the slides if mm. they take a closer look at the different yeah. types of chemo. So I don't know whether with your research, radiation therapy has been part of that need. So, well, well, in in not specifically, no. we just sort of included as um a, a, when we're when we're analysing mm. it that we would control for people who've had um, radiotherapy or who've had uh, chemotherapy. So so mm. it's more that we recognise that that's already kind of established as a possible cause, um, but don't yeah, necessarily it's... kind of focus on on that particularly. Yeah. It's such a complex subject. Mm. It is so. So the next question about, there was quite a few questions about the anti-hormonal drugs um, and severe, uh, dealing with severe joint pain. So, me, David. Yep. I'll just do the disclaimer yeah, sure. that that's not an area that I work yeah. in at all. It's a very well recognised problem with hormonal drugs. Fortunately, about 20% rather than more than that gets significant arthralgia. It, generally resolves over time, but during the time of treatment, and treatment can go for five years, can be very problematic. And what works for arthritis in general often will work for that. But, you, but I that, might that's, pass off to you. Yeah, and that's really where I was going to go with this, is that mm -hmm. our best kind of options are really looking at this as we would for any joint pain. And, and again, we would there are modalities that can help to relieve the pain and, and you know, there are like hands-on therapies, manual therapies that can sometimes be helpful. But really, I think if we looked at knee osteoarthritis, for instance, the, the, uh, the main thing that can help knee osteoarthritis is actually exercise again. Um, joints love movement and so they need movement for um, good the lubrication the snow, for the synovial fluid to circulate around the joints. Um, and, and as we said, new exercise therapies do have analgesic effects. So if we can tap into that, so to support the joint, but also um, to get some analgesic effects from, from exercise, then that's likely to be a good option. And um, so we would treat it, yeah, like we would to push through and it's filled well, it, I think, <laughs> and just keep plodding away. I think this is what's important, though, is the pacing that you described. And that's really how we would go with um, any kind of severe joint pain or chronic pain management. What you don't want, um, we, we sort of talk about two ends of the spectrum that aren't so wonderful. And one is being really passive about it and not moving at all actually makes you stiffer and sore. And you're not tapping into kind of your natural resources that you have for pain relief. The other end of that spectrum is actually what we call endurance behaviors, where people push through too much. Um, yeah. and, and can actually aggravate your symptoms where you end up having lots of flare-ups. And we talk about this over-under cycle where you do way too much and then you pay for it for days, and then you do way too much and you pay for it for days. And the nervous system doesn't like that. The um, nervous system gets very sensitive from, from that kind of approach. So steady as she goes is a much better approach where you start small, find a capacity that you can perform, and then you steadily build on that. And it's better psychologically, and you're not having to to kind of go, oh, gosh, here I go, this is going to be agony, and and, you feel and like you're achieving something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and you're Can much you more realistic. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the way I did it was that whether it was walking or writing or even on a, on a keyboard, I'd do it to the point where it was just a bit too hard. I could have gone on, I can have a cup of coffee, yeah. or I'll mm. stop, mm. I'll put my feet up for ten minutes, yeah. and then I'll walk on. It was just a case of not making it too bad because it's bad enough anyway. Yeah. So you're yeah. just trying to the real pacing. control it. Yeah. So mm. that's, that's really how it worked for me. Mm. Mm. That pacing yeah. was really mm. important. Latest treatments for long-term neuropathic pain. So um, that's really a complex area. Um, it, it, there are specific uh, drugs that interfere with nerve transmission, and such as gabapentin, and they're used because traditional um, narcotic analgesics are not that effective. So there are specific pain pathways. There are actual nerve blocks actually deadening a nerve, uh, which can be very effective for particular types of pain. But it's, an, it's a vexed area, and there are no really good 
new treatments uh, since the neurotransmitter inhibitors came along. There have been a lot of indications as to where one could go by understanding mechanism, but I can't say there's been a major breakthrough beyond what I just talked about. And, and some recognition that exercise and other non-pharmacological approaches will be part of the management. Mm. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, management of potential pain as a side effect of treatment. Should that be discussed with the patient when the treating clinicians are talking about treatment options? Um, it kind of goes back to the genetic, looking at their genetic makeup, I guess, and um, where genetically they're going to be predisposed. Yeah. Predisposed, you'd give them a different drug, but that's a way off, I guess. It, yeah, it, it is, but but there are other ways to meet that. So, for instance, some of our work suggests by doing nerve testing, we can learn about the development of nerve damage well before it's clinically apparent. So there's also the possibility of intervening and changing track earlier if you get an early warning system. But I think the general statement needs to be explored. Things like nerve damage are part of that opening discussion about the risk and benefit ratio of any treatment we do. I don't think I have a single colleague who doesn't spend a good hour before they treat patients talking to them about every single significant side effect that can happen and providing written information to give people time to take it in and then saying now we're going to have to have the discussion about here's the potential risk and remember they're not 100%, in some cases they're as little as a 5% risk Here's the potential benefit from the treatment, and now it's up to you to evaluate whether you think the risk is worth the benefit. Then the next part of that is there's going to be less intensive treatment, less risk of side effects, but less benefit, more intensive treatment, more risk of side effects, but a greater benefit. That's also a value judgment. Mm. It's not a value judgment I'm going to make. I'm going to show you what those differences are. So then the question about, well, does that mean that pain is less severe because I knew about it ahead of time? Yeah. I'm not really sure whether that's true or not, but it's always good to actually have been told in advance what to expect because there's less fear of the unknown because you've had as a lot of information. But I think Phil really should segue into this communication well, I, uh, my oncologist did that, sat down and explained the different things that could happen with the drugs that I was having. So, but you can't explain pain to somebody. I mean, it's just, you can't. You can say, it, this type of thing you will, like with, with the cold water thing and all that sort of stuff. It was a thing that, that, that I took it all in. I read everything that I could, I could read. And I thought I had a pretty good handle on it. But as you start to go through it, of course, Something will happen and you've forgotten what you just learned and it becomes a new thing. And then, oh, hang on, I know what that is now. And so I think knowing really helps, even though it, it doesn't take away the pain. It's just that knowledge that it's, it's, that's what it is. When you know what it is, you can accept it and get on with it. I would just popped up. Did okay, sorry. I was yeah. just going to say no, I would don't. add to that. In um, I'd love to see us doing m much broader assessment. So we've very much talked about the biological part of this assessment and seeing whether people are at risk or not from the, from the um, their biology and their and the treatments and the effects of treatment. But I'd like to see um, a little bit more assessment around psychosocial factors, and I think most mm. do um, pick up on that to some degree. But acting on it is we're a bit a bit away from that, where we're actually acting on it and have services that are really supportive in from that very early phase. And that would be and given what we know about that as a risk factor for persistent pain, I think that would be a mm -hmm. um, a pro progression. Mm -hmm. Which ties into the question from Grim, I think it is. Um, so a saying I think we did mention this earlier, if you have pre existing chronic neuropathic pain are you at greater risk of developing more pain from chemotherapy? So, yeah. so the answer to that for the specific drugs is absolutely yes. Mm. And for instance, I'm a little bit more 
cautious about recommending certain drugs to people with diabetic neuropathy and I might look at a different set of drugs or I might say, look, you know, the risk of the damage is such that taking a treatment option that might be slightly less effective but much less likely to cause damage is something you need to consider. Yeah. I also do that when discussing people with certain professions. So a guitar player, a jeweller, a watchmaker, they really need to know what the potential risk could be in the medium term to help them make some value judgments. Mm. Yeah. Anything to finish up with me there? Or? No, no, yeah. that's good. Well, I'll move on. So we're at eight o'clock, and I think we've done very well with all our timing. So, um, again, if any support and information that you might require, Cancer Council, we have our 13 11 20 information and support number, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. And again, Lifeline, if you feel you need to speak with me one tonight, 13 11 14, 24 hours a day. Uh, we have an exit survey, and we'd gladly I'd love to have you um, complete that. It helps us inform what we're doing and what we can do better next time. Uh, and also to remind you that a link to the recording will be emailed to you, plus the resource sheet um, that Neve had up there and some other resources to point you in certain directions if you are looking for, like, who should I go and see, what should I go and do. And the research studies we talked about, we can put links up there as well if you're interested in becoming involved in any of the research. Specifically tonight, the neuropathic pain and the work that Mead's doing, which I think specifically with breast cancer That's right. yep. patients yep. and the experience of pain. So thank you so much, and I hope you all enjoyed tonight, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thank you.